Good morning. Let's open with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we're so grateful to be in your presence this morning, Father, and just to come together to fellowship one with the other. Lord, to fellowship with you, to draw closer through your word. So, Lord, as we continue to study of how to have an amazing life on the Holy Spirit, the gifts and the fruit of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we pray your blessings be upon it. We pray for those that are traveling this morning. We pray for those that have been in our church family that have been sick. Lord, those that are going through operations, various things today, we pray that your hand will be upon them. Lord, we just love you so much. Now, guide and direct us as we go through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 It was such a wonderful vacation that we had. We took a little break, but we didn't take a break from the word. We just took a break from coming in and doing Bible study, but we are back. Let me go ahead and make an announcement. We need to start looking for a new Bible study. So if there's something that you're interested in, start taking a look, research it, send me a text, let me know, and we'll look into something to uh, go into our next Bible study with. So this morning, we're going to be on page 91, and we're going to talk this morning about a life of humility. Humility. Now, exactly what is humility? Humility is meekness. Now, there are times in our lives when we do need to be bold. We need to be bold, and we need to boldly go before the, the throne of grace. There are times that we need to be bold, but there are times that we need to be humble. So let's define humility this morning. In this lesson, we're going to learn why pride is the opposite of humility or weakness. It is dangerous. dangerous. Pride is a dangerous attribute, but humility is desirable. Now, pride and humility, gentleness and meekness, are the opposite ends of the self-assessment scale. Now let's stop right there. Self-assessment. How often do you examine yourself? I think we should examine ourselves a day. Maybe twice a day. Maybe in the morning when we wake up. Maybe before we go to bed at night. You know, Lord, if there's anything that I've done, you know, reveal it to me and let me repent. And let me move on. Let me continue to draw closer. Don't let there be anything between me and thee. Self-assessment. Self-evaluation. Where are we lacking in service to God? See, that's what it's all about. It's about service to God. Now, we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. But we also know that faith without works is dead. And what I'm trying to say is that if you're in the Word and you're studying, there are certain things that God does require of us, and that is that we serve Him, okay? God is not a banquet table where we go and sit down and partake of the feast, wipe our mouths, get up, and walk off. Okay? That's a, a, a really literal example that we can all look into. So this morning, how can we live a life of humility in serving God? Um, pride is focused on yourself, while humility is focused on God and others. Humility does not mean we should think less of ourselves, but humility means that we should think of ourselves less. In other words, are you always putting yourself first? Do you look out for the needs of other people? Do you consider the happiness of other people? Or is it all about you? What I can do for myself. There are a lot of self-centered people in this world. A lot of self-centered people in this world. Um, we're around them every day. There are people that are always focused on themselves. They're always focused on what's wrong with them, what's right with them. Every time you, you know, have you ever talked to somebody and, and you get to the point where you're afraid to say, how are you? Because it's a 30-minute thing of how are you? Um, these are people who just may not be filled with the Holy Spirit. They may, they may know Jesus, but they don't know the power that the Holy Spirit can have in your life. So let's turn over to page 92. Most people, most people equate meekness with weakness. In other words, if you're not a loud, outspoken person, then you're a weak person. Now, 
I'm an outspoken person. I'll be the first one to tell you. It is sometimes a virtue, sometimes it may be a curse. But that's my personality. In other words, if we need to say something, we're going to say it. But I need to say it with all humility. In other words, I don't need to say my way or the highway. It's all about me and I don't care about you. I need to take things into consideration. I don't need to control everything. So another misunderstanding is that humility equals self-deprecation. In other words, if you're meek, you're always down on yourself. You've always talked about your faults, the faults that you have, where you go wrong, this, that, and the other. And that goes back, when it comes to self-deprecation, that's throwing yourself a pity party. Listen, it's easy to throw a pity party. I throw several, several times, you know, uh, a year I'm throwing myself a party for some foolish reason or another. That is nothing more than an ambush of Satan to steal your joy. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to steal your peace. And the world that we live in today is so carnal is that instead of sweeping up around our own door and taking care of what we have, we're looking at what somebody else has got. Well, if I only had so-and-so, or if I had this, or if I had that. Well, you don't know what it costs people to get to that position in life. You have no clue. But the Word of God also tells us that He can't expand us or prosper us or give us a more abundant life until we thank God for what we have. Where you're at today, you need to give it 110% to make it the best it can be. Instead of always kicking the can down the road looking for the next opportunity. Okay? We have to learn to be satisfied where we are right now. Right now. And, you know, sometimes it's difficult to do. I look at my own life and I think about a time when we moved out of a home that we built and we moved into somebody else's home because we were caretakers of the land. And a lot of people, even my mother-in-law, was really funny. She said, I come, I need to come see what Frank has done to you, where, where he's put you, or what this, that, and the other. And I was put in an old log cabin. I mean, it needed some work, but it was, it was fairly nice. But you know what? I look back at some of the happiest years. I think we were there about eight years where Frank took care of that property. Now, did we own another house? Yes, we did. We had another house that we would go and we would stay. It was more like a vacation house, but it was, it was a nice house. So we did own another house. But the majority, 90% of our life, was spent on somebody else's property, in somebody else's house, taking care of somebody else's things. And listen, we walked away and we'd done a good job. Mm -hmm. We made the most of it. I was just as happy as I could be, mainly because I was happy with my husband, I was happy with my church life, I was happy with God, and God blessed me. But I guess a lot of people thought that it was a set down. We had a lot of people ask us, have y'all lost everything? <laughs> no, we haven't lost everything, but we have given up a few things. There's a difference. You have to make yourself happy where you are. It's important that you do that. So we need to be humble. We don't need to be falsely humble. But sometimes self-deprecating is falsely humble in that people put themselves down in front of other people in hopes of getting attention or a compliment. It's a sad manipulation when there's a conversation going on and somebody interjects in the middle of it and it's all about woe is me, what's wrong with me, what's going on with me, and, and, and the whole conversation is completely turned to this one person because apparently they're insecure. Now, security lies in Jesus. That's where it is. Security is in the salvation of Jesus. If you have Jesus, you really have everything that you need. But people don't realize that Jesus is more than enough. They don't realize that your cup runneth over if you have hidden Jesus in your heart. Okay? So, let's move on. No one is born humble. 
None of the traits of the fruit of the Holy Spirit comes naturally to us. We are only given the fruit of the Holy Spirit once we accept Christ as our Savior, and we are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of people have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but they don't receive it. Okay? They don't receive it. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, is powerful. It is powerful. One of the greatest gifts that I know that I have is spiritual discernment. Yes, of course, I've been given the gift to teach. That's an evident gift. But spiritual discernment is a gift that is sometimes troubling to me because I can be around people and all of a sudden my spirit doesn't agree with them. Now, that's not judgmental. That's not saying, oh, well, I don't like you because you got tattoos all up and down on your side. What is a tattoo? I, th that's foolishness, okay? I, well, I don't like the car you drive. I don't like where you live. I don't like who you're married to. I don't like this. I don't like that. Those are judgmental things. What I'm saying is that you have to examine a person's fruit. But sometimes there are people that I feel like I need to speak and move on. I need to be nice and move on. I need to love and move on. I need to pray about and I need to move on. There's an old saying, my mother used to say it, be careful of the friends you choose because if you lay down with dogs, you're going to wake up with fleas. Okay? That's an old saying. But sometimes we have to be careful with the company that we keep. Now, but the positive side is that if we are commanded to seek humility, then it must be available to us. If we are commanded to partake of the Holy Spirit, if we are commanded to partake of the fruit of the Spirit, then everything, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, meekness, self-control, all of these things are available to us if we seek them. But we have to ask God for those things. Now, let's consider humility. A definition of humility is the ability to use the power, which comes from the Holy Spirit, and resources I possess for the good of others. Now listen, it was raining cats and dogs this morning, okay? And we started Bible study back. I have to thank God because it never dawned on me until I read that. I never once considered this morning, well, I just need to stay home. I don't need to get out. It's dangerous on the road. And sure enough, part of Sumter Highway is shut down. They're working on the bridge. They've already started that. Half of that's closed. I mean, it's a, it's a traffic jam coming through there. Um, but that's okay. Um, I never even considered not coming in this morning. It is what I've been called to do. We reach a certain point in our lives when we are called to service that we just do it. It's not a hardship. But there are times and there are seasons for different things in our lives. Like Vacation Bible School was, was a tremendous success this year. But we went into it with misgivings because things were different. But listen, we worked together and God blessed it enormously. Enormously. So if he calls us to it, He's going to equip us, okay? So, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. And in short, humility, this is important. Get this, underline it in your book. Humility is having a biblical understanding of yourselves. Define yourself biblically. I've written that in the book. Define yourself biblically. One of the things I have always taught that God gave me years ago, look at everything through spiritual eyes. Look at everything through spiritual eyes. Okay, so why did I have to probably several miles slow down to a crawl getting here this morning? Okay? Well, you know what? It was raining cats and dogs. So it's a lot better to travel slowly through the rain than it is to speed through the rain. I thank God that I had enough sense to leave early this morning to get things prepared before I got to church this morning. So, but let's go ahead and look at what's going to hold us back. It's the enemy of humility. 
Pride is the enemy of humility. What I've got, who I am, what I've attained, what I drive, what I wear, where I work, who I'm with, the house lives in, the house I live in, blah, 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 blah. Do you realize that is foolishness in the eyes of God? Foolishness in the eyes of God. We were created for one thing, and that is to bring God glory. Let me repeat it. You have been created for one thing, to bring God glory. If you are not giving God glory for everything that you have, everything that you are, one of the worst things, and, and it was it's something that I really fought, having to go on camera. Now that I've gotten older, I don't like to look in the mirror. I don't like to see myself. And I certainly don't want people looking at me on camera. I don't. Okay, do you realize I'm putting myself down? I'm actually putting down God's creation of what he made me to be. Okay? I have a crazy husband who tells me all the time how beautiful I am. I told him I, that's, the only, that's the only reason because I'm the only woman in the house with me. You ain't got nothing to compare it to. But in seriousness, when he talks to me, I understand what he means. It's not always outer beauty. It's inner beauty. Okay? It's inner beauty. Okay? I had someone ask me years ago, ask Frank and I, are y'all always together? Do y'all do everything together? Yeah. How can y'all stand each other? Six months later, this man's going through a divorce had no clue what he was talking about. How do you stand each other? Well, there's times that we have to have a day apart. But for the most part, he's my best friend. We do very well together. We enjoy one another's company. Okay? So in other words, make the most of where you are and what you have and thank God for it. Now, pride goes before a fall. Proverbs 16 and 18. Pride goes before destruction and the haughty spirit before a fall. It talks about a professor that did a study and he taught seminary. And he followed the lives of the people who graduated or quit or whatever. And some of them fell from grace. Some of them did not go on to pastor or to evangelize or to do the Lord's work. In all of the cases that he documented what he found was that all but one person had pride, had a sense of pride and arrogance. The very day that you think you're better than somebody else, or you're a cut above, or you know what, I've accomplished this, you better watch out because you're about to fall on your face. You are about to fall on your face. Because when you think more highly of yourself, now it's true, I can't put down God's creation because God is, it's what it's all about to me, okay? But it's a tool that Satan uses. We're studying the enemy of humility. The enemy of humility is that, number one, Satan does not want you to evaluate yourself. He does not want you to look through spiritual eyes. He does not want you to accept that you are joint heirs with Christ Jesus. He does not want you to understand the inheritance that you have. Okay? Now, there is a thin line between wanting the best for God's glory versus our I, our own glory. Well, let me just tell you what all I've done. Let me just tell you what all I've accomplished. Let me just tell you this. If it were not for the grace of God, I would not be sitting here today. I would not have what I have. I would not be who I am. I would not have a love for God's people. And I would not be sitting here teaching Bible study. Because, to be honest with you, being on camera is totally out of my comfort zone. Totally out of it. You're not going to find me on, the, on national TV. Because that's not me. But for God's glory, here I am today. Okay? I praise God for opportunity. If one person can get something out of what I'm speaking, and get encouragement, peace, and understanding. I praise God for it. Now, if we grow to depend on the praise of other people, 
Yes, there are times that people will say, Lord, I love to hear you teach. I know what it is at one point in time to have 22 people sitting under the sound of my voice and them thoroughly love and enjoy Bible study. But on the other hand, I know what it's like. This morning, I have two people sitting here watching me teach. I have one person online. I don't know how many people will watch it on, 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 on YouTube. I don't have a clue. But you know what? It doesn't matter. I do not, I have never one time gone in to check the views. Because it doesn't matter. If only one person views it, then that's what God intended. This ministry that God has given me is in God's hand. So if we grow and depend on the praise of other people, that means our happiness rests in other people's hands. If we don't get praised, we are deflated, we're humiliated, even we're angry. Our fallen human nature has to be propped up continually by all the wrong motivations. Now, let me say this. Sunday, there were only 10 people in church. Only 10 people. Let me say this. We had one that had just come home from the hospital, he and his wife. We have another one that is, is out on training that has someone in the hospital. We have another one that was on vacation. We had another one that was traveling. But we did have one lady who came in who had fallen and had an arm in a sling. Okay? I can tell you the people that were missing here, and I can tell you why they were missing. They weren't just sitting home eating bonbons. Okay? They were living life. Okay? But let me tell you this. Did not hamper the message. Strong message came from the pulpit on Sunday. Did not hamper the sound booth. There were people in the sound booth, working the sound booth, to perfection. The spirit in the church was tremendous. The praise and worship in the church was tremendous. Where two or more are gathered, gathered God says he's going to be in the midst. And he was. It was a truly enjoyable day in the house of the Lord. But our world has got us looking like, well, if we don't have a big, successful church full of money and prominent people, then we're not serving the Lord. When I look at almost 60 people that were here for Vacation Bible School commencement night and the joy and the laughter and the fun that we had, I know that we're doing what God has called us to do. And that is an outreach in the community. Now, we're going to close up with the enemy of the humility on the, near the bottom of page 93. Now, if we grow to depend on the praise, then we're, we're doing everything for the wrong reason. Our fallen human nature has to be propped up continually by all the wrong motivations. And that suggests that we're doing God's work for the wrong reasons. It suggests that our work or our gift was not for the Lord, but for ourselves. Well, I want to all know I put $1,000 in the plate on Sunday. Now, that is a lie from the pits of hell. I have not put no $1,000 in the plate on Sunday. But the point I'm trying to make is when you tell people what you're doing for the Lord, well, I come in, Ryan, on the cleanliness of the church all the time. But not one time Ryan says, well, you know, I cleaned the church. I did so and so, so and so. I have no clue the dirt that Ryan is dragging out the corners. I have no clue the dust bunnies or the spider webs that Ryan is, because he's not telling me. He's just doing what he's doing for the glory of the Lord. And there are other things that get done around the church that people have no clue, number one, what they're doing, when they're doing it, how they're doing it, how long it takes for them to do it, what it costs for them to do it, either time-wise or money-wise. That's a good thing, that we're not boasting and glorifying ourselves, but that this little small church, even though we have issues, the core and the heart of the church is Jesus, and God sees our heart, okay? So, pride has a ravenous appetite needing constant feeding and affirmation. Humility, on the other hand, is self-sustained by grace and by the blessing of God. Throughout the day, we should be 
continually to give God thanks for the little things in our life. I know sometimes maybe I've had my mind stray while driving down the road and God saved me from maybe running into somebody or running off the road. I mean, it happened this morning. I was paying attention, trying to get my phone plugged in this morning. It wasn't working. The next thing I know, I weaved over the other line of traffic. I said, I, and I realized it and got back. I said, Lord, thank you. It's a habit when we give God praise for the little things in our lives. Doesn't make us perfect. Doesn't make us without fault. But it does help us to draw closer. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, how we love you and we love your word that gives us encouragement. Lord, we love your word that shines the light on the times that we have failed you. Lord, that we can come to you and ask for forgiveness for not doing things maybe that we should have done. And then sometimes, Lord, for doing things that we should not have done. But Lord, that's grace and that's mercy. So Lord, as we continue to study humility, let us focus more on others. Let us focus more on what we do that brings you glory. Let us focus less on ourselves, what we need, what we want, and just building a life around ourselves. Let our lives be built on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, continue to bless us, continue to guide us and direct us. Show us the way that you would have us to go and keep our feet on your path of righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.